All right, I'm going to call the meeting of the ISFMP Policy Board uh, to order here in beautiful Beaufort, North Carolina, October 19th. I want to welcome everybody as we wind down from a very busy meeting week. Um, we'll start off with uh, we have an agenda. I have one uh, addition to the agenda from Eric Reed that carried over from yesterday. So I'm going to call on him when we get to other business. Uh, I believe, Dan, you might have something you want to address in other business policy board. Okay. And then uh, Tony's got something uh, that she wants to update everybody about related to some Mid-Atlantic Fisher Management Council activity. So any other changes, modifications to the agenda, uh, I will be uh, presenting the chair's report here. Uh, and Pat asked that I do it like somebody from New York, but I'm not sure that's physically possible for me, but I'll I'll make it as quick as I can. So any other modifications to the agenda? Any opposition to the agenda as modified? We'll consider it accepted by unanimous consent. We also have the proceedings from July and August 2023. Any modifications or corrections to those proceedings? Seeing none. In the opposition to accepting them, then we'll consider those accepted by unanimous consent. Uh, public comment. Is there anyone in the room from the public? I don't see anyone. Anybody online from the public? So we don't have any public comment. So I'm going to launch into a brief report on the executive committee activities, and then I'm going to follow that up with my chair's report. So uh, the executive committee met yesterday morning. Uh, we covered a variety of topics. Uh, first is uh, AOC Chair Joe Semino presented uh, a summary of the FY 2023 financial audit, uh, which was a clean audit, once again, uh, attributable to the uh, excellent services we have from our financial and administrative support group. Um, so that report was considered and approved by the executive committee. We also had a discussion about per diem rates that had carried forward from a previous uh, executive committee meeting. Uh, after some discussion, there was a motion made and approved to increase the uh, meals and incidentals rate by 30%. And so are there any, any questions about that while I'm addressing that topic? Okay. And then Alexander provided an update, a legislative update. Uh, several things are still in the queue. Uh, obviously, as most of us realize, things are a little tumultuous over there in, inside the Beltway these days. So uh, um, we'll just keep tabs on things and keep everybody updated. Then Laura uh, provided an update on future annual meetings, and our, our next annual meeting will be in Annapolis, uh, Maryland. And Lynn has assured us that it's going to be a fun time for everybody. So we look forward to, to being in Annapolis. Uh, other business items included a update on CAA spending, and we're winding that down. I think we're going to have most of that money accounted for. And also, uh, Pat Kelleher provided us just an update on uh, some eel aquaculture activities up in Maine. Um, I certainly encourage you, if you're not familiar with American Unami, is that right? Unami? Unagi. Unagi. Okay, American Unagi. Y'all, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they they have a pretty amazing operation up there, and I'll just throw one statistic out and correct me if I'm wrong, Pat. But they are producing a biomass of yellow eels from that one facility that is greater than what we're actually harvesting. That right from wild populations, so it's it's pretty amazing. So they have a nice website. They even have merchandise. So if you'd like a t-shirt that says eels across the front of it, you can get a eel t-shirt. So um, so that pretty much concludes our activities for executive committee. Any any questions about that? If not, I'm gonna go uh, into my chair's report. Um, first and foremost, I wanna thank you all for your support and you're giving Joe and me this past year. It's been a busy year with a lot of challenges and successes. I am proud of our ability to collectively meet our issues head on and work through resolutions that we can all support. I'm pleased to say that over my term as commission chair, we have successfully revised three of the commission's foundational policies, our appeals process, the minimus policy, 
and our conservation equivalency guidelines, which I hope to be finalized later during this policy board meeting. Each are fundamentally important to ensuring that we treat each other fairly with clearly articulated guidelines and processes and without undue burden in the management process. There's been a lot of stock assessment activity this year with benchmark stock assessments for American Eel, Black Drum, Jonah Crab, and Winter Flounder all endorsed through our peer review process and accepted for management use by the relevant species management boards. Another five benchmark stock assessments for River Herring, Red Drum, Atlantic Menhaden, Ecological Reference Points, Atlantic Croker, and Spot are in preparation for completion in the 2024 and 2025 years. In response to the American Eel Benchmark Stock Assessment, finding that eels continue to be depleted, the board initiated an addendum to consider changes to the coastwide yellow eel harvest cap to include using a new tool for setting the coastwide cap based on abundance indices and catch as proposed by the Benchmark Stock Assessment. At the same time, the American Eel Board is working on an addendum to address Maine's glass eel fishery quota which sunsets in 2024. Commissioners also took important steps to increase spawning protection for the Gulf of Maine, Georgia's bank stock of American lobster and rebuild American striped bass. Though the adoption of Addendum 27, the American Lobster Board established a trigger mechanism to implement management measures, specifically gauge and escape vent sizes to provide additional protection of the spawning stock biomass. Earlier this week, the board reviewed the annual data update of American lobster indices and the Addendum 27 trigger index and discuss whether new management measures will be needed to implement the addressed trigger, trip trigger and ensure the sustainability of this valuable resource and fishery. In May, for the first time in 12 years, commissioners used the emergency action provision of the ISFMP charter to implement a 31 inch maximum size limit for striped bass recreational fisheries in order to control recreational harvest and protect a strong year class that could aid in strong stock rebuilding. This action responded to the near doubling of estimated recreational harvest from 2021 to 2022 and the strong likelihood that the 2029 rebuilding timeline would not be met unless fishing mortality was reduced. In August, the Atlantic Stripe Bass Board extended the emergency provision until October 28, 2024 and initiated development of draft addendum 2 to consider management measures designed to reduce fishing mortality to the target and to promote stock rebuilding. Yesterday, the board approved this addendum for public comment. This year was one of heightened stakeholder and media scrutiny of the commission's management and supporting science. Concerned stakeholders contend that there is localized depletion of Atlantic Menhaden and the Chesapeake Bay largely due to the reduction of fishery, and that this depletion has resulted in the declines of other fish and bird populations in the bay. In an effort to address this issue, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and Maryland Department of Natural Resources are each developing approaches to assess the ecology, fishery impact, and economic importance of Menhaden populations in their portions of the bay. Until we get more specifics about Menhaden within the Chesapeake Bay, Menhaden will continue to be managed on a coastwide basis with the use of ecological reference points. The science behind our management of horseshoe crab populations in Delaware Bay has been criticized by stakeholders and in the media. There have been years of work by conscientious state and federal bird and fishery scientists to improve the adaptive resource management framework, which has been endorsed by an independent peer review panel of experts. Yet shorebird advocates and journalists challenge the validity of the decisions made based on the ARM framework, opining that our management of horseshoe crabs is the primary factor contributing to the demise of endangered shorebirds like the red knot. The commission welcomes constructive input and criticism and we'll continue to refine our models and management with the best available science. However, I want to say unequivocally that the commission leadership has confidence in the ARM framework revision and fully support its use in setting harvest levels, levels for horseshoe crabs of Delaware Bay origin. In the next year and for years to come, three overarching themes will continue to dominate commission discussions and actions. These are the impacts of potential overestimation of recreational harvest and effort due to a bias in the Marine Recreational Information Program Fishing Effort Survey, the effects of climate change on our coastal resources and communities. The most recent issue of Saltwater Sportsman highlighted a tarpon caught off the beach at Cape Cod and a new state record King Michael in Delaware is sort of emblematic of the things that are that are changing out there and the intersection of protected species and fisheries. All three issues will significantly impact our management process 
and our success in addressing them will lie in our ability to, to be open and honest about the issues before us and to seek solutions that are both that are best for both the sustainability of a resource under our care and the communities that depend on them. So in closing, I want to thank the staff for their support during my tenure as commission chair. I also want to thank Joe for his willingness to serve as a leader and for his valuable perspective over the past few years. Uh, I know that he and Dan will do a great job as chair and vice chair. So I look forward to working with all of you as we strive to ensure that we have healthy fisheries along the Atlantic coast. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Uh, now I want to launch back into this uh, conservation equivalency policy guidelines, technical guidance, whatever we're going to call it. Uh, <laughs> We've been chewing on this for a while, so I, I hope that we can we can bring this to closure with unanimous consent. Uh, if we're not unanimous, then I feel like you know we'll just call, we'll have to call a vote on this and see if we can move it forward. Uh, uh, I know there's concerns about certain parts of it, and I certainly understand those concerns. We all look look at this through the lens of past experiences and future possible consequences. Uh, but I think this is one of those situations where we've got to be careful and not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Tony and uh, we'll get started. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to say thank you um, for your leadership over the past two years. It's been a really good time sitting up here with you. And all right, so we're going to run through conservation equivalency guidance document um, just as a reminder. Uh, the application, this, this document is to provide guidance on the application of conservation equivalency and how the commission uses the process within our management plans. Um, we started off from a task from the executive committee, the management science committee provided information on some of the more technical aspects of the document in particular. Um, some of the requirements of data analyses in, in the requirements for proposals. Uh, at the last meeting, we went through a version of the document. The policy board provided some guidance and changes during that meeting. Those changes were made, emailed back to the policy board. Additional comments and changes were emailed to me. And the document you have on your meeting materials reflects all of those changes that folks had asked for. In the case where there wasn't agreement or created options in the document for the board to consider today. Um, the document um, is overall more streamlined now. I tried to get rid of some of the duplications in the document. Um, it has the background section, general policy guidance section, a portion where describes when conservation equivalency is not allowed, what needs to be contained within the state proposals, what those standards are, what the what the review process entails, and then information on coordination and guidance with our federal partners. Um, I did receive some feedback from folks um, that the document was moving in a direction where states wouldn't have the flexibility anymore to do what conservation and equivalency is intended to do. And, and that is just the part of sort of the, that allows states to have the flexibility to craft management measures that meet the needs of their state fisheries but still has the same or greater conservation as the standard FMP measure. And so I tried to roll some pieces back in the document. I don't know if I rolled it back enough or not, um, but to still be able to allow for that flexibility for states and yet still have some guidance and policy within the document itself. The document definitely no longer has a lot of suggestions or recommendations. Um, so if there are places where we want to bring it back to a suggestion or a recommendation, just point those out and uh, we can roll those back. 
Um, so today I'm just going to go over the sections where we have options in the document as to not reread the entire document for the group. So the first part is um, where conservation equivalency is potentially not allowed. So it's just thinking about what is the status of the stock and do we want to give guidance to, to the boards on whether or not conservation equivalency can be permitted. Um, the first option, and these would be, the first three options would be standards across the board for all FMPs. Um, and then the fourth option gives the responsibility back to the management board itself. Um, so the first option is to not allow conservation equivalency in any FMP if the stock is overfished. The second option is to not allow conservation equivalency if the stock is overfished, depleted, or unknown. The third option is to not allow conservation equivalency if the stock is overfished unless allowed by a board via two-thirds majority vote. And the application of um, the voting policy on two-thirds in Article 2 would apply, and that's if the um, federal partners abstain, then they don't count to the denominator. And then the fourth option is to allow for board discretion for making the decision on whether or not conservation equivalency is allowed or not. Um, it, can, it can be based on stock status. Um, if a board implements a stock status restriction for CE, it can choose to apply that restriction to the entire fishery or part of the fishery. So meaning identify a, a specific sector that that would apply to. And if a board decides to not implement a stock status restriction for CE, the board would pro provide a rationale in their meeting proceedings as to why the CE restriction is not needed for that species if it, the stock were um, overfished or, or overfishing was occurring. Then moving on down into the document and looking at the non-quantifiable measures, the, um, this section just identifies um, if a state is submitting a proposal that has something that cannot be quantified, um, that that can be a part of the state's proposal, but it can't count towards um, meeting the equivalent standard of the FMP. And it provides some examples of what are non-quantifiable measures at this time. These can change in the future um, if we have the ability to quantify them. Um, these non-quantified measures are include circle hooks, non-targeting zones or periods, no gapping, outreach promoting best practices for release, and measures that are expected to reduce release mortality or overall discard, other measures of, of other discards. And there were some folks that felt strongly about removing this language and other folks that wanted to keep this language. So I just made it an option. Um, the next uh, section where we had disagreement amongst the board is looking at the standards um, that have to be in a conservation equivalency proposal. And this is um, looking at standards if a proposal has a closed period as part of its proposal. Uh, the document states that any closed periods must come from periods of high availability and include at least two consecutive weekend periods, uh, Friday, a weekend meaning Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, there are some folks that did not want this bolded language to be a part of the document and others that did. I will note that this language came from that management and science group that had evaluated some of the more technical aspects of the document and were part of their recommendations. And then lastly was actually a question from me. Um, uh, as I went through these last final changes, while we had originally said that conservation equivalency plans had to include an end date from the state, um, if I thought to myself, if we are reviewing these conservation equivalency proposals every year and the board can terminate a proposal or 
not a proposal, terminate a program if it's not working in some way or another, then does the board, does that proposal need an end date if it's being reviewed each year or not? Just a question to the board. Um, you can make a change to that or not. And then just as a reminder, as Bud said, we're trying to get this document finished today. So that will be our final consideration is to approve the document. Any questions? All right, go ahead, Jason, and then I'll go to you, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, Tony, the, the only question I had, I was thinking about the high availability are kind of subjective still. Um, so I'll offer you what, how I interpret that. And, and my concern is, it might not be, you know, if you put a closed period in, it might not be the highest uh, wave, let's say, but um, it has harvest in it that's relatively high for for the year. Um, so that would be my interpretation of of that. Is that um, what you think as well? I, my yeah, I agree with you, Jason. It's it doesn't necessarily have to be the highest availability, but it shouldn't be the ones where you basically have no catch during that time. All right, Doug, and then I'll go to Dan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Tony. Uh, I just want a, a clarification on page four. This uh, wording under um, what are non quantifiable more measures. The way I read it, it said these measures could include circle hooks, non-targeted zones. But uh, do you, is the intent of this is that would say that as of right now, these are the ones that you cannot use, period. Or could you, if you could come up with, say, for circle hooks, you've got studies that show um, how much uh, lower mortality you have with certain spears, species for circle hooks. But the problem we have is we don't have an idea of how much, how many people are using circle hooks. But if people put in a a uh, uh, a study which, or put it in their recreational monitoring where they could actually say 50% of our public uses uh, um, circle hooks on this and so we're realizing this percentage could they in, in fact use it it's not I just want to make sure this isn't just locking these out forever uh, but if they can demonstrate it uh, in a quantifiable manner they could use circle hooks or some of the other things uh, and Doug that's why I Someone had asked me to put some examples in the document. So that's originally why I put these in here. And I phrased it in the way it could include because we wanted to leave the window open for the ability, you know, if we do come up with quantify ways to quantify them, then, then that is 100% fine to use. You just need the math to show that the measure can be equivalent to the standard of the FMP that you are trying to replace. All right, Dan, and then I'll go to Shanna. So my question follows up on Jason's um, comments uh, relative to the requirements of closing times of high abundance. So my understanding of, of how we've used that data is, uh, for example, wave five, September, October, in Massachusetts, there's a whole lot more fishing going on on Labor Day weekend than there is on Halloween. And so uh, the catch rates are average for that month, but are uh, but if you and if you lose days on the on the back end, uh, you're probably not saving many fish. So my question is is actually relative to Richard Cody's presentation. Are we seeing a future where we're going to have monthly MRIP estimates in the future, and would that help resolve that? I, I think we are going to have a future where monthly is going, where we will be getting monthly information. I'm going to turn to Jason. I think it'll help resolve that, but he's shaking his head yes. So, yes. Because I think 
that would that would minimize the need for that because the you know if you're looking at a two month wave the catch rates are can can vary a whole lot you know trending from one end of the wave to another but if you're getting into monthly waves maybe you don't need that can you can you go to this um, proposed changes at slide six yes um, I guess, Dan, I, this, that is the pleasure of the board. If you think you don't need it anymore or not, I think the intention of the group, and Jason has his hand up though, is to make sure that we are, that that the state is considering these higher availability timeframes um, versus incredibly low variability timeframes where catch is not really occurring and you're not really impacting the stock. And I'll note that the, the two week consecutive period with the weekends was to make sure that um, shorter, shorter closures, um, you see a lot of recoupment and you wanna, you wanna have at least a minimum amount of time for that. But Jason, go ahead, or, well, that's you. Yeah, um, ju just to um, clarify, so I, I think it is a goal of MRIP to get there. When that happens, I, I don't, I'm not sure, um, given all of the things that they're trying to to do. But uh, to your point, Dan, I, I think there's still a need to even, you know, I think it gets better. <laughs> you know, you can be a little more refined a month um, with that, but you still have there have been in the past people trying to put in conservation equivalencies where they're like ticking off like a couple of days and then they sort of spread them out. Um, and so I think that's what this is trying to avoid. So I, I think there is still a need. All right. Um, everybody good on that? I'm going to go to Shanna and then to Erica. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Tony. I know this document has been a labor of love, so I just wanted to give you a shout out and say thank you very much for listening to all of us and uh, giving us some options to talk about this morning. Um, so my question actually is also related to this, so I'm, I'm glad that this is up here. Um, and I think, Tony, you did a really good job of um, kind of telling us that you're looking for making sure that there's a long enough time period that there's not recoupment. Um, I did uh, have a question. Has um, law enforcement gotten to like kind of look this over and think about whether or not that's a long enough time period? Because I think one of the considerations that we make in trying to create a closure mid-season is yes, to make sure that we're not creating a short enough period that, you know, if you have three days there, that doesn't really mean anything. But also, um, what would be most effective for like enforcement? So like a minimum closure period, I'm kind of less, I guess not less concerned, but less concerned about the um, high availability times and more kind of worried about like, how long do we need to close maybe mid season in order for law enforcement to actually see, um, to have enough time <laughs> to make sure that people aren't out there still fishing during kind of that open, the closed season period. So just, just a question to that. We did not specifically bring it to law enforcement. I'll offer Kurt to come to the microphone if he has any um, insight. I know that we've talked about two-week closures and summer flounder scup like sea bass prior before, so maybe he remembers from then. <laughs> Shorter closures are not um, really liked by law enforcement because they're such a fine window. Um, but as far as having the ability to enforce them or be prepared to enforce them, as long as it's gone out publicly and noticed and it's in regulation codified, we're already planning for that. We'll be aware of that up front um, on the seasonal basis of what our priorities are, where we're going to be. Um, so we'll have that opportunity to do that. Um, to have a short closure like this is not really ideal for law enforcement. You know, it's just, a, you know, but we understand it has to happen at times and, and it does happen at times. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Here's a quick follow up. Um, so do you think the two weeks is kind of optimal for that? Is, is, 
it seems kind of short still in the middle of the season, but just wondering. The longer the duration, the better. All right, Erica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Tony, thank you too for the time that you spent on this and the time that you spent with me uh, talking through this document. I wanted to ask you whether you thought under the measures that cannot be qualified, whether that um, italicized bold wording is actually needed in order for the TC to make a decision about the effectiveness of a or measurableness of a um, CE proposal. Great. Strictly examples. Um, so whether or not examples are needed, I guess some people ask, what does that mean? Maybe sometimes it can be helpful for a group, but it is 100% necessary to conduct the business? Probably not. They'll still need to evaluate. Okay, but why don't, uh, Lynn, and then why don't we focus on the one that's up on the screen and see if we can make a decision about that one. And, and decide whether we want to keep that bolded language or not. So, Lynn, and I'll go to you, and then I'll we'll come back to that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it, it's not this is not really a question. It's just a follow up to what Erica said. Um, and yeah, thank you, Tony, for your work on this. I do think to, to Erica's point of whether we need this sentence, given the TC is going to evaluate. I do think what this does is provide the state with some guidelines up front to save time. So I think it's really important, you know messages to the states don't don't be doing this stuff where you're doing you know a weekend here and a weekend or a wednesday and a friday it just gives every puts everybody on the same playing field going forward um so i think it's i think it has that value yeah i kind of liken this to when you uh take a father's daughter out on a date and he says bring her home early enough or he says bring her home at nine you know it's like there's some value in specificity. So, uh, um, to Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Looking at the wording um, that's before us, any closed period must come from a period of high availability and include at least two consecutive weekend periods. I can think of examples from the past where if the required reduction was relatively modest, something in the five to ten percent range lopping off several months at the beginning or the ending of a um, fishing year might suffice even though that's not the period of high availability but if, if in the past if we wanted to make a modest change sometimes we took those off-season approaches uh, to get a, a fairly low percentage reduction All right, Justin, and then Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, from my standpoint, for the record, I, I like option one. Uh, I appreciate the, the guidance to keep sort of a minimum length of a, any closure to make sure it has some chance of being effective and that the effort just isn't displaced before and after the closure. Uh, but the term high availability to me is just subjective. What's high, what's not. Um, not sure exactly what availability means in this context. Is it a period of high harvest? Is it a period when the fish are available? I mean, I'm thinking about Tautog in Long Island Sound. There's plenty of Tautog available in New York in the summer, but they've been closed for a long time. So we don't have any record of the catch and harvest there in the summer. As someone who likes to spear fish in the summer in Long Island Sound, it's a constant source of annoyance for me that you guys aren't open in the summer, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so. I just, you know, for me, I appreciate the intent, but I just think the term is too subjective and, and, you know, the metric of the the effectiveness of the proposed closure should be the math, whatever math is done to estimate the, you know, the potential savings in the harvest. Um, and just to note, when someone makes a motion on this, if you're deciding you want to keep the language about the closed periods, we make sure you're very clear about what's getting deleted versus not. In the end, I, I was thinking that the whole sentence would go away. Um, I was sort of shorthanding the, <laughs> um, for, the, for the slide. So just be very clear if you're gonna split the sentence in half and you wanna keep part of it, then make that motion that way. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd, I'd be willing to make a motion to try to advance the ball forward here if, if you want to do that at this point in time. 
Um, why don't you go ahead and make that motion and we'll see if we get a second, but we still have, we have other people in the queue, so go ahead. Okay, so I would move to delete the words, let's see, come from a period of high availability and such that it would read any closed period must include at least two consecutive weekend periods, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and that section of text that's bolded. All right, we have a motion. I have a second from Doug Haymans to that motion. I had Doug, is that? Yeah, I was just going to agree with both Roy and Justin's points, and Justin okay. did exactly where it was, so that's why I okay. second it. Shannon, were, was that uh, your topic too? So go ahead. Um, it was, and I completely agree with Dr. Davis's points. Um, the one thing I guess I would say is to kind of take into account for what Roy is discussing. I sort of envision this close period as a more mid-season issue than a beginning of season issue. So for instance, I think that like Roy said, there's times when we do closures, especially from maybe the beginning of the season, that I think that we can actually get some pretty good savings for. I maybe don't agree with that being just a couple of days, but I could maybe find some comfort level on it being, let's say a week. Um, I think that the two week period is a little bit long if we're considering, like Roy is saying, maybe some small reductions that need to be made from either the beginning or the end of the season. All right, uh, Malcolm, and then I'll go to Doug Grail. Yeah, I think um, I agree with your motion, and it takes out some of the question. When reading this, uh, the initial document says it must come, and then when we have the keeper delete, it says should come. And to me, that's a very different point. Um, one allows the TC some ability to look at what the option is, if it's a should. The other one requires that it must come from that. Um, so I was gonna say if, if it, the document said should, which gives the TC a chance to um, look at it. But, you know, Justin, your uh, option takes care of a lot of that also. Okay, Doug Grau, and then I'll go to Ray Kane. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I uh, definitely uh, feel uh, supportive of including the words, uh, it must include at least two consecutive weekend periods. I was wondering because I, I can, I can, um, this this period of high availability, would it uh, be more comfortable for the board if it said period of high availability within a wave? Um, because I can see where there are certain waves if you took it at the end of the wave or at the beginning of the wave. You'd have a you could have a two week closure and have absolutely no impact. Um, and if you narrow this down to within a wave, you're not talking about having to take it, say during a high avail, you know, one of your highest catch uh, weight waves, like in New Hampshire, the you catch the most fish in wave four uh, for many species. But if I was to uh, need to put in a closed season for striped bass, for example, uh, in wave three. Uh, I, and, you know, I have to take a 15% reduction. I could get two weeks closures in, in wave three, but if I took it at the beginning of the wave, there's no effect. If I take it during the period of high ability, uh, take it in the period of high abil uh, availability during the wave, we have uh, I could, I would have uh, a sufficient, uh, I would have some actual impact on it. And so that's where I personally think we have to um, include some, some aspect of high availability in the motion. Uh, and maybe if, I don't know if Justin would feel more comfortable with, uh, well, I would, um, I'll see where the discussion goes and I may, uh, do a motion to amend on this 
or just to try and include some concept of this, but within a wave. All right, Doug. Uh, thank you, Ray Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Why don't we have enforcement in the room? I would like this to read uh, the closed period of retention, because I don't know how we're going to stop recreational fishermen from fishing. And I think that's what we're talking about. And I'd like to hear from enforcement how they would enforce something like this. If you're just going to tell the public you can't go fishing, people are going to fish. I think the word retention has got to be in this motion someplace. Can we hear from enforcement, get an opinion? Ray, I'll, I'll just state that a, a, a proposal can have retention, harvest closures, um, no targeting closures, they're all different types of closed periods. And this document isn't getting into the specificity of the types of closed periods that need to occur. It is just generally talking about closed periods. I would say if we start getting into that type of nitty gritty of the document, it would um, be very, I don't know, <laughs> we're gonna start spinning our wheels here a little bit, but Kurt can discuss the enforcement of, of those things, but we didn't get into retention versus no targeting, um, at all when we were discussing this as the management science group. It was just about closed periods, per period. <laughs> so uh, basically closed periods is not new to us. Um, in law enforcement, we deal with it in several fisheries, striped bass commercial being one of them with closed days. Um, the key to any type of closure like this where it's a short window or, or a tighter window is, is proper education, getting the message out, um, letting the regulated community know what's going on. Um, get the voluntary compliance, all those things help us in law enforcement, you know, be impactful on these types of closures. Um, but, you know, we, we have, again, having the proper notice and having it codified in our regulations up front, not a last minute type change, we'll have time to prepare for these types of things and dedicate resources as needed. And I'll just remind the board that this document is for all of our species. It is not just for one particular species that I think we have our minds on and that um, that any species management board can add additional requirements to conservation equivalency in the FMP itself, which striped bass has done and it does have additional CE requirements. So if there is something that a species boards wants to be more restrictive on, then that species board can do that but this is intended to be useful for all of our FMPs um, to give some guidance. So keep that in mind as we try to move forward here. Thank you, Tony, for the explanation. Thank you, Tony. All right, so, so what we have now has removed the, the, the high availability term, but still includes two consecutive weekend periods. So. This this would be the guidance, or you, you as a state proposing conservation equivalency would have to propose something that includes that. So that's the question: is that too prescriptive or not? So, Bill, I'm gonna go to you. Yeah, thank you. I was just gonna speak in favor of the motion without any further amendment. I think the the argument that this all comes down to math is va valid, and the inclusion of at least two consecutive weekend periods is sufficient to give us confidence in that math. Thank you. Yeah, and also just, you know, maybe you read this from the, the draft documents is uh, when evaluating closed periods availability will be considered uh, parenthetical, even within a month availability can be very different, particularly when comparing the beginning and the end. So that's you know, sort of implied that, you know, you're going to have variability, whatever you're looking at. So, so uh, we have a motion, we have a second. We've had some discussion. Any more discussion on this motion? Any opposition to the motion? Not opposition, but can we caucus? Yes. Okay. I'll give you a couple of couple three minutes to caucus on this. 
Mr. Chair, quick quick question. By approving this motion, we're basically approving option two, right? There's no need to go back and revisit whether we keep or delete the language, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, option two with with modification. <laughs> All right, a very okay. Lynn, you have a question. Just a clarifying question, if I might. So to be clear on this, a technical committee, if there's a needed reduction for a species, the technical committee could recommend to the board as an option, a six day closure, right? So this doesn't limit what a board may consider outside of conservation equivalency, correct? Correct, a board could have less than it is fairly standard, I will say, to have closed periods be no less than two weeks. I recognize we recently had some that were 10 days, um, but it is a pretty much a standard that they should be two weeks time because of recruitment. All states and SPUD asked me this question that this closed period for the pro CE proposals is, it's what is it? 16 days, um, it ends up being two, 16 days because it is the closed period has to include two consecutive weekends and you can't have openings in the middle. It is an entirety of the closed period. Okay. Yeah, 10 days. 10 days? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that would be 10, da 10 days, right. Okay. All right, we, we've had a we've had a caucus, so I'm gonna ask the question again. Uh, any opposition to this motion? Seeing none, we'll consider this accepted by unanimous consent, and the docket going forward will reflect that. So I'm gonna back up to the ask Tony to back up to the beginning of this, so we can go back and deal with these. Uh, choices we have to make in the order in which they were presented. So uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to her just to quickly go over this this one again. Doug, do you have a question? So that was a motion to amend the wording that was in there. We haven't made a decision yet as to whether. No, that was the, that was the motion to accept, basically to accept it with option two as, as modified. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that clear? Everybody clear with that? Okay. All right. Okay, very good. So the first set of options, and I'll note that the options were not were, uh, numbered correctly in the document, I'm sorry. Uh, it is one, two, three, four in order. Um, but these are when conservation equivalency is not permitted under stock status guidance. Um, the option one is just simply when it's overfished. Option two includes depleted and unknown as well as overfished. Option three is um, when the stock is uh, overfished unless the board by two thirds vote says it is allowed. And option four allows it to be to the board's discretion itself. All right, Jason. Uh, I have a motion, uh, Mr. Chair, whenever you're ready. Uh, so make your motion. Okay, so uh, I move to approve the fourth option for inclusion in the document. All right, do I have a second? John Clark, second. Okay, so we have a motion to accept option four. Board discretion, species board will consider the use of, uh-oh, take it away. Can I say one more? CE is not allowed. Go ahead. Jason, can I add just a couple words to the end so we just know which, so it's transparent to the public. It's for, uh, in the document for when CE is not allowed, just to say when CE is not allowed to the end of your motion. Yeah, oh, that's totally fine, yep. All right, we'll get that option, that list of options back up so everybody knows what we're, deliberating on here. All right, go ahead, Erica. 
have a question about how this will work, and maybe this applies to all of these, um, all of the options before us. Does the board's decision have to be codified in an amendment in order to create CE options for that species? Or is it simply a, a motion by the board and that codifies what CE is allowed for each species? I think you're, uh, to my reading of this, when a board gets a assessment and the stock is either overfished or overfishing is occurring, then the board will make a decision if CE is not allowed. It is always the, the standard is that it is allowed unless a board decides otherwise. So if the board does not get say no more CE, then the automatic would be it continues. Follow up to that, Erica, are you clear? So just to be clear, does that decision have to be codified in an amendment or is it the motion at the board that lays that out? It would be a motion by the board. All right, so we have a motion and a second uh, discussion on this motion. Everybody clear what this means? Chris Bat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I think the specificity you know, kind of makes option four clear, but it's kind of what we do right now. Um, I, I feel more comfortable with uh, some, some guardrails on, on when conservation equivalency can be used when the stocks overfish. So I can make a substitute motion to, um, to approve option three. Uh, if I get a second, I'll add a little more justification for why I think that. All right, we have a substitute motion and we had by Chris Bat Savage and a substitute, I mean, a second by Doug Grout. Okay. So that is option three is now the substitute motion. Discussion on the substitute motion. Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we had a pretty robust discussion on this uh, the last time this document was brought to this board. Um, I completely agree with Mr. Batsavage. I'm much more comfortable with option three. Um, essentially, it is option four, but it requires a majority, which is something that we don't do right now. And I think the thoroughness of requiring a majority means that we'll have a much more robust conversation on the record regarding why we are deciding to either permit or not permit conservation equivalency. So I am in full support of this uh, motion to substitute. All right, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, I so I'm in agreement that three and four have a lot of similarities, um, and I'm okay with option three um, as well. I think it makes it a little more formal and rigid, which is why I selected option four, because what I was trying to avoid is deep regret in the throes of a board meeting with you know multiple votes going around because you can never foresee all of the situations you might want to be sympathetic with. So um, I can get behind this. Um, I, you know, I fear regret, but um, we can always come back and fix it later. So thanks. Yeah, I think regret's part of our world. We just can't seem to get away from sometimes. So I got Joe Samino and then Dan. Well, I, this is my first time on the mic, so I also want to thank Tony for all the work on this. Um, I'm exactly where Jay is because I think a lot of the discussions that we've had show an inherent bias to CE. We've had discussions about backs to the wall and needing guardrails in a way that suggests that we're not talking about an equivalent measure, but something we think people are getting away with. And so that concerns me with some of these votes because 
we have technical experts that are saying it's conservationally equivalent, but we're treating it differently. I, I agree there are going to be options that are uncertain, and that's where board discretion is important and trusting our technical folks. I too can live with the two thirds because I think you know when Dan put that in, it, it it hopefully will give us flexibility for types of CE that we're not really thinking about necessarily that are going to be important in the future. Um, but I do worry about that bias, and I hope that as we move forward, um, we can we can you know recognize that in some of our votes. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. We go to Dan and then to Justin. So this. I think it's a question for Tony. Um, could you paint the scenario where this would take place? Is it my correct understanding that the board would approve an addendum and it would be at the following meeting where somebody would be coming back saying, hey, you know, we know what, what was passed there, but we really want to take a different tact on this? Or do you expect that when the board approves the addendum, at that point, they, they have to start playing a conservation equivalency card. So if this motion were to pass um, and there are, are stocks that are overfished, it's not an addendum because it's when an assessment comes through. You get an assessment, and if the assessment says the stock is overfished, then the board would need to consider either at the time that they receive the assessment or I would suggest the following meeting if they're going to task the TC with evaluating some information that came out of that assessment. And the board would then decide either, you know, one of those two meetings, whether or not they want to allow CE for some reason, and then they would need to vote to do that. Um, any CE program that was in place um, prior to the assessment, and then we have the overfish status, and the board keeps conservation equivalency not allowed. Then any CE programs, the board would need to um, work with that state to bring to end those programs and put new measures in for that state at that time. It wouldn't be like immediate must change everything right away you'd have to work through that process to bring those ce plans back to whatever is the standard of the fmp it may be that the board is putting an addendum out or an amendment out to change the measures of the plan to address that overfished status and those states would just come in to new measures through that addendum or amendment process. That would be what I think would be the most likely that would happen. All right, Justin, then we'll go to Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I was interested in the language in option two that says overfish depleted or unknown. And I note that that isn't included in option in the amended, the suggested amended motion, um, I don't know, I was, I was trying to think through a scenario in which conservation equivalency would come into play for species that are depleted or of unknown status. And I was kind of having trouble coming up with one, but I, I just thought I'd throw it out there for the board's consideration that maybe it would be important to include that and in whether we go with, if we do end up going with option three of including that language that CE should not be permitted if the stock is overfished, depleted, or unknown unless allowed by board vote. So just putting that out there for consideration. If you want to add it, then we would need to put it into the motion. All right, Dennis, and then I'm going to go to Doug Rao. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just backing up a little bit, the idea of this revision to the conservation equivalency document was intended to put more teeth into the document. And it was, this is the result of quite a lot of work by various people, including say myself, Joe Semino and others that worked on a sub subcommittee for, I don't know, but off and on for a year, it seems like. But I support option three and I, really like the idea of having a two-thirds vote because it isn't how many times have we sat here and 
some of us have not been happy with the fact that the technical committee, by virtue of how they do things, were had to support a conservation equivalency proposal when some of us, or not some of us, when people knew that the effects of it probably wouldn't meet the intended purpose. And I think the whole object here is to put some boundaries around conservation equivalency. And I view this as a very correct approach in dealing with conservation equivalency moving down the road because there are socioeconomics and other things that have to figure into our decision making other than the technical committee alone saying, okay, we've run the numbers and this is what it is. So let's support option three. It's a good compromise. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. All right, Doug Grout, and I'm gonna go to Steve Train. I'm just gonna pass because I've already had my questions answered. Thank you, Steve. And then I'll go to Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, maybe I'm not fully grasping this. Um, if we have a species X that's overfished and we decide the states need a little more leeway, they get and we vote two thirds, then each state may be able to go to conservation equivalency. My question is, do we evaluate each conservation equivalency plan and require a two thirds majority for that if we do it? No. The two thirds only is to allow the use of conservation equivalency. And then any state that puts forward a proposal, if it is allowed, is just a regular vote of the board. All right, Roy, and then I'll go back to you, Jason. Mr. Chair, I wonder if I might ask if, if option three were to pass, or, or perhaps even option four as well, um, what happens to grandfathered? conservation equivalency measures. I'm thinking of striped bass, for instance, where we have some grandfathered conservation equivalency for an overfished stock. So if, if I could, if someone could answer that for me, then it, it might color how I would vote on option three or four, thank you. Roy, at this time, the striped bass board allows the states of Delaware, New York, New Jersey to have some CE plans. I would not use the word that they are grandfathered in because those plans get approved through um, the changes in the FMP every time there's language in the FMP that says this will or will not be allowed. So I wouldn't use the word grandfathered. If the board wants to just say in any point in time in one of their addendums that these are programs are in perpetuity until the state decides to make a change. That is the prerogative of the board. But any CE plan that is in place and if overfish comes forward, then all of those plans would need to be evaluated as the board addresses that overfish status. A board can make a decision to say, yes, this is allowed and this is no longer allowed. It is up to that board to make that decision. But I would not use the word grandfathered um, for anything. <laughs> All right, Jason, then I'll go to you, Lynn. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I'm, uh, I'm, if unknown comes back up, it, it hasn't yet, um, but I'll hold my comments. It, until if and when that does. Okay, Liam. Yeah, so just back to the process, I, I think I, I can live with option three, but I think I can think of several species where conservation equivalency with the guardrails in place and other places in this document could actually serve the resource better, but perhaps tensions in this room might make it more difficult for a state to go down that road. Um, so I, I'm wondering if when an assessment comes up and the stock is overfished, if it would be too much to ask if the technical committee or the SAS as part of that assessment could help the board understand um, 
why management measures might have different impacts in different areas. So a simple version of that is, is striped bass, where the same size limit in Chesapeake Bay, in Maryland, Chesapeake Bay, isn't necessarily going to have the same conservation impact as a size limit on the coast, so that when an overfish status comes up, the board has a real understanding of, okay, we have a situation here where this species really is distributed. There's a different demographic, there's a different age distribution, there's a different something that would make it more difficult to provide a, a uniform um, regulation. So I guess I'm, I'm, I don't know that I'm totally clear, but I think more information would inform a two-thirds majority vote better. I think it, it could be helpful. So Lynn, I'll give you two paths that you can sort of utilize what you're looking for, I think. So a board is going to get a stock status. You, are, you know, if this were to pass, that there are some CE plans out there. If your state has one that you're interested in, sort of retaining, then when you get that assessment, you can task a technical committee to evaluate the CE plans prior to making a vote on whether or not conservation equivalency is allowed so that you can utilize that during your voting process. If CE is no longer allowed, I and again, if a stock is overfished, I'm assuming the board is going to do something to address that overfish status, States that have CE programs can include the measures that are in your CE program through this upcoming addendum or amendment process. It doesn't, you know, it's not saying that individual states cannot have unique measures. It's that you need to go through the FMP process to get to those um, unique measures. You, Part of, I think, where some folks have uh, hesitation in the use of CE is that you don't go through the public process to get there. You don't, no one gets to comment on them. And so individual state programs can go into that addendum or amendment that is addressing the overfish status. And you can still have those, especially for ones that may provide more conservation to the resource. Um, and it'll be evaluated and the board can make a decision on them there. So I think that there's two paths where you can get there. All right, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks to Tony and the committee that put this together. A lot of work clearly went in. I, I seconded option four. I still think it's the best way to go is that board discretion. Uh, we had a good example bringing up striped bass again just yesterday where if the addendum had included a commercial maximum size, the gill net exemption would have required states to come forward with CE and it's an overfish stock. So to go through another two thirds vote just to get those plans approved after the plan would require, or the addendum would have required them to come forth with a CE proposal seems like a bit of overkill there. Um, plus just seeing some past votes, sometimes we have difficulty determining what two thirds even means for some of these boards, whether certain entities are even eligible to vote. So I think it's better to just stick with option four. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. All right, we've had uh, a lot of discussion here. So I think we're at the point we need to vote. So we have a substitute motion before the board. And, and based on what I heard from Justin, if we do vote the substitute up to the main motion then we can certainly entertain a motion to amend that main motion to add any language that we think is necessary to improve it so at this point i'll, I'll give you a few minutes to caucus uh if, if you think it's necessary i think it's good uh caucus on this before we vote all right, I'm going to read the substitute motion just to make sure everybody's clear on what we're going to be voting on here, and that is move to amend to replace the fourth with the third option. And let's put that slide back up that shows exactly what that third option is so everybody knows what we're doing. There we go. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion to substitute, I mean, 
uh, signify by raising your hand. Those opposed, like sign. No votes. Any abstentions? I don't see any. So motion 12 yeas, uh, four nays, no abstentions, no nulls. So that now becomes the main motion. So the main motion now is to accept option three. Yes, Doug? We count it five nays, but maybe that's wrong. Okay. All right, five nays. All right, so we any need to caucus on this vote? Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry to belabor this, but I did want to offer a motion to amend to add the add the terms or the words depleted or unknown to that option, as I discussed earlier. Okay. So let's we'll see if we can put that up there. Is that your intent with that? Okay. Do I have a second? A second for that? Ray Kane, second to so is everybody clear what this motion to amend does? It simply adds those words into option three. So option three would say, see, he is not permitted if the stock is overfished, depleted, or unknown, unless allowed by board, et cetera, et cetera. Any discussion on this motion? Uh, Jason? Yeah, I would caution. Uh, I, I'm opposed to this uh, amendment. I, you know, you can have a stock with unknown status that's an enormous abundance, and, and um, you know, I, I just I think this adds you know a bunch of uncertainty into the process. So I I don't think we should uh, make this amend amendment. You know, even depleted gives me concern. So I think keeping it, keeping with the original motion is the way to go here. This is, um, again, just like before, I think this would cause us uh, regret probably pretty quickly. Um, so I don't think we should, uh, I, I don't support the amendment. All right. Thank you. All right. I've got uh, Megan and then Erica. Thanks. I think I'm on a slightly similar page to Jason where the unknown is making me a little nervous just in the volatility I've seen in assessments, but also assessments, you know, failing or going to, from a model base to an index base or whatever. So um, I'm, I think, a little more comfortable with depleted, uh, but definitely not. Uh, I'm struggling with the unknown part of that. All right, Erica and then Chris. Thank you. Um, I'm also speaking in opposition to this motion for specifically the unknown part of this. Um, many of our coastal sharks, we do not know their stock status and we likely never will. For species like red drum, um, we manage that based upon spawning potential ratio, so we don't have an overfished or overfishing determination for that stock. So I, I think leaving it with the um, previous motion is better than adding depleted or unknown. All right, Chris Bat Savage, and I'll go to you, Shannon. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I could support depleted, you know, kind of for the, the reasons that, uh, that 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 Megan gave, and I was you know, thinking about some um, examples where un where unknown would fit in. So I appreciate Erica uh, giving a couple. Um, probably couldn't support. The motion with unknown in it, but uh, I, I could I could support depleted being added to the this uh, this option. Thanks. All right, Shanna, and then I'll go to Marty and, and Justin. Yeah, I won't belabor the point because I think Megan and Chris covered it really well. Um, I completely agree. I I'm not comfortable with unknown. Um, however, for a depleted stock. I will say that I feel like we don't afford them a lot of protection or thought sometimes. There's not a lot of action associated with a depleted stock. So I'm not sure if this is necessarily the appropriate place to do this. However, I, I can't support this motion as stands, but I could have some more conversation on adding depleted. All right, Marty, and I'll go back to you, Justin. Yeah, just a point of clarification. It's 
it's still a poor decision though, right? At the end of the day. Or not. Uh, under this option, the conservation, if, if you have a, an assessment that comes forward and it is overfished, if you add these two, depleted or unknown, CE will not be permitted unless the board decides to allow it via two thirds vote. But regardless of that language change, correct? It doesn't matter. But, or maybe I'm not reading it's, it right. I mean, CE will, if you don't add these two statuses, CE will not be permitted if the stock is overfished. The board can allow it by voting to be a two thirds vote. Yeah, this yeah, this language just merely adds those other two stock status descriptors into it. And that's that's been the subject of the discussion is you know, those those have different meaning to different people in different circumstances than overfish does. So Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't know if this is a possibility, but I, I would be fine if this was changed to just say depleted. Um, I think we've heard around the table that the unknown part is what's giving people pause about this. Um, I don't know if Robert's rules allows for that, but maybe Spud's rules allows for that at this juncture. I don't know. So, yeah, Spud's rules of expediency are, do permit such things as that. So. Um, we can we can as are you fine with that right is this okay so we're going to take the word unknown out of this motion to amend so now we have the word depleted so now we can have a discussion about that if anybody would like to if not then uh anybody need time to caucus on this one you don't see any hits okay good all right uh I will try. Is there any opposition to the motion to amend? All right. We do have one vote in opposition. Any null votes? Any abstentions? I'm assuming the others are yays. Okay. All right. So that motion carries. So now we have an amended main motion, which is the language of the third option with the word depleted added. So it's overfished or depleted. And then that would require a two thirds vote by the board to allow conservation equivalency in those circumstances. So, so basically we have a slightly modified substitute motion that you voted up. So any discussion on that and you need to caucus on that if not is there any opposite malcolm no can you just read the current motion into the record please just one second. yeah we got to make sure we got it right here okay the motion under consideration is c CE is not permitted if the stock is overfished or depleted unless allowed by board via two thirds majority vote. Parenthetical, the rules on voting in Article 2, Section 1 apply. So that's the motion. Any opposition to the motion? Seeing none, any no votes, any abstentions? All right, so that motion carries. So in the document going forward, uh, it will be option three. Uh, under that section. Okay. Ready to move on to the next one? Yep. So, Madeline, if you can bring up slide five in the presentation, this is um, whether or not we want to include the examples of what non quantifiable could include or not. Yeah, Doug, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, move to inc uh, approve option one, include the sentence above. All right, do I have a second for that? Jason, I have a second from Dr. Jason McAmey. Right, any discussion on this motion? Erica? I'd like to make a substitute motion, and that substitute motion would be to remove or to choose option two. Okay. 
Do we have a substitute motion? Do I have a second for the substitute motion? Motion, well, is that a second, Ben? New guy, okay. <laughs> All right, so now we have a substitute motion in front of us. And that is option two. So we'll, once we get that, we'll bring it back up so everybody knows exactly what we're looking at. Lynn? Hey, Mr. Chair, I just have a question, and I think it's just because I'm, I don't know, my brain's just probably tired, but what would be a scenario where not having this language in the document would matter? I'm just trying to figure out where, how would it matter? Does that mean that if somebody said, oh, we're going to use circle hooks as a CE method, well, if you can't quantify it, the technical committee should review that and say you can't quantify it. So I'm trying to understand why this, where practically this language would impact a, a CE. Yeah, proposal. I think these these were, as, as Tony said, included as examples of the types of, of things that are difficult to quantify. It doesn't mean they're impossible to quantify. It just means they're difficult to quantify. I can just tell you from the South Atlantic Council standpoint, it's descending devices. It's proving, you know, you all you know they work, but knowing it and proving it in a quantitative manner is completely different, different situation. So, but we do have a, a motion that belongs to the board. Uh, so, Jason. Yeah, just um, to add on, you know, I thought Lynn's comment was good, and that's how I was kind of thinking about it too. Um, so the value that I saw in having it, which is why I seconded Doug's um, motion is you, you could see this list. And then if you're intending on, you know, using something like that in a CE, you know that you've got a burden of proof that, you know, so it's very clear. And I just, um, I saw value uh, in it for that reason. Okay, further discussion, Erica? Thank you. As the maker of the motion, I thought I would speak to this. Um, as Lynn said, not including this language does not change or alter the technical committee's ability to evaluate whether what the magnitude of catch or harvest might be under a conservation equivalency proposal. And um, at several of the options that are listed here, Florida is actively trying to quantify right now in support of things that are happening at the South Atlantic Council. So I think the including things may date this document and it would be better to just leave it. I, I'm concerned that we are driving decisions and it, it hasn't been, but before I was very concerned that we're driving decisions about what goes in this conservation equivalency guidance for the entire commission based on one or two species and not considering the full suite of species and assuming that all conservation equivalency is some way to circumvent the commission's management intent. So I think that by removing this, we would show that we're not looking down upon conservation equivalencies and we're considering all species. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion on this? Any need to caucus on this before we vote? All right, we'll give you all a few minutes to caucus on this one. Everybody ready? Everybody ready on this one? Okay. So, um, all those in favor of the move to substitute for option two, raise your hand. You got them? All right, lower your hands. Those uh, opposed? Okay, no votes, abstentions. All right, it was six yeas, 11 noes, and no nulls, and no abstentions. So, motion fails. So, we're back to uh, the main motion, which is to approve option one uh, for non quantifiable measures. Um, just, can we put that back up there again just to make sure everybody knows what we're looking at? Okay, that's the, that's the sentence that would remain in the document. Okay, is there any opposition to 
the motion to include this in the document. I don't see any, no opposition. Oh, one vote, we have one opposed. Any nulls, any abstentions? No. Okay, so motion carries. So this language will remain in the in the document. Okay. And I think that's all of the option choices we needed to go through, but there is a question that uh, needs to be answered by the board so we can finalize this and, and get this document approved uh, for implementation. So, Tony? So back to that last question that I had as I was reviewing the document, if we are going to review each state's conservation equivalency each year and uh, evaluate, uh, does a conservation equivalency proposal need to have an end date or not? Um, it's just, if, if you think it should have an end date, I can alter the document. I mean, if you think it should have an end date, then the document would stay as it is. If you think that we do not need to have an end date, then I can just change the language in the document. All right, Doug Grout and then Jason. Uh, I would say that you do not need to have it in that document. Do you need a motion or, or can you just take general consensus? Uh, Jason? I was just going to say the same thing, so uh, I support what Doug just said. Okay, is everybody clear? So restate, restate that, Tony. So, so I, I would alter the document to say proposals do not need an end date. And the reason for that is that they are being evaluated each year through either a process set up by the board or via the FMP review process. And the board has the discretion if they think it's not meeting the uh, the objectives of the proposal, the state's plan, then it can terminate that CE in any given year. Everybody clear on that? I see a lot of heads nodding. So, okay. So that was the last decision point related to modification of the document. So, it. Yeah, so now we need a motion to approve the document as modified through today's deliberations. I think we'll have a, we've got a written motion. Yeah, we've got one we're going to put up on the board. So I'll, someone's willing to make it, I'll get you to read it into the, into the record once it's up there. All right, uh, Mike Ruccio, I see your, your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry for belaboring the, the conversation around an end date. I, I guess, I'm, I'm looking for some certainty that that process that Tony described about deliberate evaluation for something that exists in perpetuity is either implicit within the document, the commission processes, or within the respective FMPs or, or board process. I guess I, I do have a little bit of concern that something could exist in perpetuity and just want to make sure that we have some checks and balances on that to make sure that it, as it proceeds through time, it, it is achieving what it's designed to do. All right, Mike, she's looking through the draft just to see where that's addressed. So, Mike, on page seven uh, is the plan review following approval and implementation. Number one states that it will be evaluated on an annual basis, either through the FMP review process or something otherwise specified by the board, and that the PRT is responsible for evaluating all aspects of the program. And if the conditions and goals of the FMP are maintained or not, if it's not, then um, the PRT would report to the board on the performance of that CE program and can make recommendations to the board to change it if necessary or not. And the board can make that determination uh, to end that program. Any follow up to that, Mike? Answer your question. Yeah, thank you for that, for that, Tony. Uh, I, you know, I, I think I help, still have some reservations, but um, I'm satisfied that there is a process. And, and we have to... thank you, Mike. My question's been answered. No, 
All right, thank you. So where's our motion? All right, is someone willing to make this motion? Uh, Lynn Fagley? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move to approve the conservation equivalency policy and technical guidance document as modified today. Thank you. Do I have a second? I have a second from Ingrid Brown. All right. Any need for any more discussion on this? Any opposition to this motion? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you very, very much. So, very good. I can go into my semi retirement with a clear conscience now. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> All right, um, just to keep us moving along, I mean, if you need a biological break, just don't, you know, just step out. But I want to keep us moving along so we can stay on schedule. Uh, we've got Dr. John Hare uh, online. Um, he's going to walk us through an update on North Atlantic right whale funding uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act. So, uh, John, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much, sir. All right, well, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, great. And I'm sorry I'm not there with you in Beaufort, uh, but it is a beautiful day here in uh, Woods Hole. So yeah, I just wanted to quickly, you know, provide an overview of the North Atlantic Right Whale Inflation Reduction Act funding, and then, you know, open the door and you know be working with all of you to just coordinate uh, all of the activities that are going on. So next slide, please. Um, you know, the funding, we've got $82 million for North Atlantic right whale activities with the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, really a historic opportunity uh, to invest in sort of the future of how we're going to address this conservation challenge. Um, and we, we sort of laid out the IRA funding to follow um, the agency's uh, road to recovery, uh, which has two main components, address the threats to North Atlantic right whale, and monitor our progress and recovery. And then there's three elements to each of those two major pieces. Um, and we're gonna use the IRA funding to focus on developing and implementing transformative technologies and approaches as part of this road to recovery. Um, and we will, again, as I said before, we'll be complementing and leveraging other funding sources. Next slide, please. And so, you know, the IRA funding really enables, you know, these transformative investments. And our goal is to develop and advance technologies and new approaches that support dynamic management um, based on a more informed understanding of the spatial temporal distribution of right whales um, and also enabling the timely responses to where whales are detected. Um, so that, you know, we're gonna be deploying uh, existing and developing new technologies for North Atlantic right whale detection. Uh, we're going to be integrating these detection technologies into risk models and assessments to support more dynamic management. Again, fully recognize, you know, partnerships with multiple industries to help us do this together. Um, and then leveraging the IRA funding uh, with other pieces to really support the science components, the management components, and the enforcement components. Next slide, please. And this just, you know, gives a, a, a breakdown of, you know, how these funds, how this 82 million is going to be used. We have, you know, 3.2 million to support uh, sort of the administration and project coordination. Um, and then we have a large chunk of funds to support monitoring and modeling. Uh, big emphasis, 17.3 million in passive acoustics monitoring and their uh, the Regional Wildlife Science Consortium hosted a workshop a couple of weeks ago to make sure that we're you know, getting out in front on coordinating all the, the passive acoustic work that's going to be going on. We have 3.5 million to help us, at, you know, think about satellite tagging, which, you know, currently we don't do with North Atlantic right whales, um, but we are going to, you know, see if there are new technologies that could could be applicable. Um, we have some funds for uncrewed systems development. Then we're going to be continuing to advance uh, models which we're using to support management, the uh, decision support tool uh, for the uh, entanglement risk um, and the models which support the vessel speed rule. And then another investment in using very high resolution satellite imagery and artificial intelligence detection to see if we can't really expand the footprint of the areas that we're able to detect right whales over. 
The next big component of the spend plan is this vessel strike risk reduction. Um, currently, we, you know, the agency doesn't really have, you know, dedicated funds to think about a more dynamic uh, vessel strike science and management paradigm. So these, this $20.1 million is really is going to be used to help us do that. Um, so looking at, you know, develop, identifying, developing, implementing, uh, you know, technologies for vessel detection and avoidance um, to sort of help us uh, reduce vessel strikes as a risk to North Atlantic right whale. And then the other component is uh, continued additional support for the on-demand fishing, uh, working to develop the interoperability standards for gear conflicts, uh, training for use of the systems, and just providing additional support to ongoing activities. And then for 5 million, relatively modest amount, uh, going to the Office of Law Enforcement to provide them some additional equipment for enforcing regulations uh, with regards to North Atlantic right whales and also to support some of their operations. Um, next slide, I think that's it. I just really wanted to quick, you know, provide you all an overview. Uh, you know, happy to take questions now, but looking forward to working with you uh, to, to really, you know, continue to address this challenge that we face together. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, any questions for John on this presentation? Don't see any, but uh, thank you for being with us this morning, John, and give us some. Yeah, update. sorry, I'm not there in person, but uh, I'll see you next time. All right, very good. Thank uh, you. Take care. Bye bye. All right, we did have one individual that wished to make public comment. Uh, we started early, so they were not able to, they didn't log on until after we start. So I'm going to uh, give uh, Tom Lilly a couple of minutes to address the policy board. So, Tom, uh, can you hear me? Uh, Spud, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so go ahead. Uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes, please. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Spud, it, you just said that the uh, you're not gonna do anything to help Chesapeake Bay until you get more spatial data available. Um, board member, what you're really doing here is nailing shut the coffin on the Chesapeake Bay. And I hate to think that you're really you know, trying to return back to quantitative management of this resource uh, and refusing uh, to do the holistic management that Amendment 3 uh, really requires. Uh, you know, are you abandoning your amendment, uh, your ERP science that says the straight bass are the indicator species of the level of Manhattan harvest? Five years of young of the year a failure in a row, a catastrophe. So, uh, Spud and the board members, uh, uh, Bob and uh, Lynn, uh, don't you agree that you, the board and every one of you knows right now that they're based on the ERPs, that there's not nearly enough Manhattan in the Bay? Do you agree with that? Isn't that what the ERPs are telling you by definition? So, Whatever the amount of Manhattan in the Bay right now, what we know is that it's not nearly enough. Am I correct? Uh, is there really any other information needed? So, knowing we don't have enough policy board, is it your policy to stop right there? Or it is your policy to apply the holistic management required by Amendment 3? Or are you abandoning both the ERP science and Amendment 3 uh, and the requirement that you are to act on the available science? Uh, just ask yourself the questions, uh, board members. What can the commission do right now to increase the Manhattan coming into the Virginia Bay by at least 50,000 tons? Uh, and ask yourself the question, am I doing everything right now that is necessary to make sure the Chesapeake Bay experience for our people and our children is the best it can be? Because it's all up to you right now, this board, to set the policy uh, of the ethics and the justice required by your charter uh, to treat Maryland fairly. Maryland that is probably having about 2,500 schools of its Menhaden 
that would be migrating to Maryland to help us being caught in Virginia. Uh, is that is that justice? Is abandoning Amendment 3 in the ERP science the direction that this policy board wants to go? Isn't this situation so important that this board right now can direct the staff to look into the cause of this catastrophe with the reproduction of striped bass? The cause is shouldn't be too hard to figure. Your ERP science defines it. So really the question is, uh, holistically, not quantitatively, how do you effectively reduce that harvest in Chesapeake Bay? And I think the staff could give you some very clear options. I appreciate your giving me this time, but isn't this such a question that the staff could give you those options within uh, a week or so, they're pretty obvious. And the board, the striped bass board, the Menhaden board, isn't this important enough that they could have a special meeting within the next 30 days and All take right, some I'll, action? I'll need to wrap it up. Uh, Spud, thank you very much and have a great retirement. All right, thank you. All right, we're going to move on to our committee updates. Uh, I want to call on Janita to give us uh, an assessment of science committee report. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. The Assessment Science Committee met in late September, and there are two main changes that we wanted to bring to the board's attention. The first is that the River Herring Assessment, which was meant to be presented in February of 2024, has now been moved to May. This is based on the assessment workshop in August, where the SAS decided that they needed a little bit more time. The second and larger change is that the spot and croaker benchmark assessments, which are usually done together, have now been uncoupled. Croaker's assessment will be completed in 2024, and the spot assessment has been moved to 2025. The main reason for this is because we no longer have a stock synthesis modeler for the joint assessment. Additionally, there is a project being conducted for spot at the University of Maryland that follows a concurrent timeline as the new spot schedule. So we are seeking support from the board for the changes presented today. And just for your reference, here is the updated stock assessment schedule. I know it's really hard to read, but this was also included in the supplemental material for your reference. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any, any questions? I don't think we, we don't need a, necessarily a formal motion, just general concurrence with those changes. Anybody have any concerns about those, those changes? Saying none, then, then we're good to go. All Great, right. thank you. Thank you. All right, Kurt, I'll turn it over to you for a law enforcement committee update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The following is a report of the activity of the law enforcement committee since our last reporting period. The LEC has been successful in and has participated in the following deliberations. We participated in discussions in reference to the current tag tagging study out of New York and have provided comments in reference to tag types and duration of the study as well as collaborating with the striped bass plan development team with proposed regulatory language in reference to flaying at sea in consideration of four higher participants to have specific regulatory options in draft addendum two. Additionally, the committee was informed on the status of addendum 27 of amendment three of the American Lobster Fisheries Management Plan, specifically the consideration of timeline of gauge size and escape vent changes in LCMA one. The LEC can be in a meeting this past week, and we address the following topics. Continued review of the documents, the document guidelines for resource managers on the enforceability of fisheries management measures. This document dated 2015. A, subject, a subcommittee was established in the spring of 2023 with the goal of finalizing a draft document for the LEC approval. Three meetings were held over the summer, and a revised draft document was presented to the full LEC at the annual meeting. Our next step to, will be to score and prioritize the management measures contained in this document. This will occur in late 2023 with a goal of the board's approval in 2024. Deputy Chief Jason Schnellbecker of New Hampshire Fish and Wildlife, excuse me, New Jersey Fish and Wildlife, reported on his experience in the second phase of the Nuclear ICCA Wildlife Officer Exchange Program with the Belize Fisheries Compliance Enforcement Agency. He shared his experience of traveling to Belize and learning about their fisheries management programs. 
This shared experience helped to increase international collaboration and individual capacity to address wildlife crimes globally. The committee also discussed how best to utilize the Interstate Wildlife Violators Compact to share license sanctions among participating jurisdictions. For example, if the state of Maine were to issue a license sanction for a violation of their regulations, the state of New Hampshire or Massachusetts or any compact partner state with like regulation can also revoke the privilege of this same fisherman in their state based on the Maine suspension. For our member state agencies, this appears to be an unused resource that could help protect our marine fisheries and offer deterrent. The following is an example of patrol effort and casework being conducted along the coast by our law enforcement partners. Two main marine patrol boats involving six marine patrol officers hauled 870 traps in one day. A main fisherman was charged with exceeding the lobster trap limit of 800 and fishing 30 untagged lobster traps. The charges are currently pending in court and 70 excess traps were seized by the officers and will be libeled. Additionally, a five-month investigation resulted in another Maine fisherman being charged with possession of an untagged and undersized halibut. These violations were witnessed by officers during, during a boarding in the overnight hours. The fishermen were summoned, the fisherman was summoned for lobstering without a license for possession of undersized and untagged halibut, and a Marine Mammals Protection Act violation for possession of harbor porpoise that was referred to NOAA. Through continued surveillance offshore, this fisherman was also charged with fishing 56 untagged lobster traps. Five months later, he was again boarded offshore and found to be engaging in a licensed activity while under suspension. Officers from Georgia DNR, while working with NOAA, working a NOAA JEA patrol, boarded vessels, boarded the vessel at Gray's Reef with four people on board. These fishermen were found to be in possession of 11 undersized black sea bass. They also possessed one red grouper and one gag grouper. The season was closed for both grouper species. They also did not possess a descending device on board and the fishermen were also were not using circle hooks as required. These violations resulted in a federal referral where a summary settlement of $825 was paid. And finally, this past week, officers from Rhode Island Environmental Police received a complaint of people shore fishing and reported to be taking overage of striped bass. Officers responded to the area, and upon investigation, they found a fisherman who was in possession of three undersized tatag. And upon being interviewed, the fisherman admitted to hiding striped bass in the tree line. Officers located 13 striped bass, 12 of which were undersized, and one, one of which was oversized. This fisherman was summoned to district court for these violations. Mr. Chair, this is my report. One anecdote is I would like to thank the commissioners who were able to find our meeting room and participate in our session. And for those of you that did try to get there and couldn't find us, we really appreciate the effort. Well, you know, you all do some of your best work undercover. So I guess we're just trying to, you know, just trying to make a... We, we did not place the caution tape outside. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Kurt. Any questions for Kurt on his report? Thank you. We certainly appreciate the efforts of our law enforcement folks. It's, uh, it's a tough job these days and getting tougher all the time, so we really appreciate it. All right, at this point, we'll turn it over to Simon for uh, reports on Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat Partnership and the Habitat Committee. So, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, hi, everyone. I just want to give you guys an update on what the Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat Partnership and the ASMFC Habitat Committee have been discussing while you guys have been having fun up here. Um, <laughs> so we, the steering committee for the Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat Partnership, we met on Monday and Tuesday and we reviewed a number of items. We went over our newest action plan, sort of to revisit what we've accomplished so far in 2023 and the next steps going into the next year as well as we updated the subcommittee and working groups for the various tasks that we do as a partnership. We discussed fundraising strategies, um, the ACFIP business plan, as well as all of the BIL and IRA funding opportunities that relate to habitat restoration. And we also finalized our annual funding application for fiscal year 2025. And we were um, honored to, excuse me, have 
Todd Miller from the North Carolina Coastal Federation give a presentation about the amazing habitat restoration work that they're doing. We also had Jason Olive from the National Fish Habitat Partnership and the U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife Service give a uh, update on the activities on the national level, as well as Ryan Roberts, who um, was a part of that conversation as well. Next slide, please. Regarding the BIL and IRA funding opportunities, the Atlantic Coastal Fish Habitat Partnership, we did put in a letter of intent for the NOAA Climate Resilience Regional Challenge, which was a string of eight projects all the way from Florida up to New Hampshire. And those projects were focused on oyster reef restoration and engaging the underserved community. We sought almost $25 million in funds and we were not successful. There were about 900 applicants for this particular opportunity. <laughs> so I'm not the only one who's disappointed. And then coming up, we are going to submit a similar type of proposal for the NOAA Transformational Habitat Restoration. Um, that's a bit of a smaller fund, but our target is around $15 million. And we're going to have a bit of a more focused watershed approach in Georgia, Delaware, and New Hampshire. And hopefully this one's successful. Next slide, please. Um, regarding the funding application that ACFIP puts out every year, this year's <clears throat> funding application will be open at the end of the month on October 31st, and it will close on January 31st. That's also because the, uh, the projects have to be recommended to the National Fish Habitat Board by the end of March. So there is some reviewing and ranking in between there. Um, as per usual, it's focused on fish habitat conservation projects. There has to be a one-to-one -one non federal match, which can be a bit tricky for some of the smaller projects and partners. Um, but more or less, it's the same as it has been. A little bit more emphasis on DEIJ components and public access. And this year, we have run the application through an online form rather than the classic Word document. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to the Habitat Committee, uh, we met you can go to the next one. We met on Wednesday and today. And yesterday morning, actually, I forgot to include this, Todd Miller uh, gave us all the tour of the North River Wetlands Preserve, and we got to see one of the sites that ACTIV helped fund for D Donor Marsh Project. And uh, it's beautiful out there, and they're they're doing really doing really well. So if you ever have a chance, go check it out. Um, but yeah, this Habitat Committee we met on Wednesday and Thursday. We discussed the Habitat Hotline conversations surrounding maybe changing up the format, figuring out what topics we need, but most importantly, there is a need to follow up with y'all and uh, the broader audience to kind of figure out what the most applicable content for that publication is. And we also discussed the Habitat Management Series, the current, the current version being focused on acoustic impacts and it's at the finish line, we just got to clean up some comments and then also topics for the next issue. And most importantly, we have now completed the Fish Habitats of Concern. Sorry. <laughs> we have <laughs> completed the Fish Habitats of Concern document, which I'll uh, give you guys a tiny overview of in just a minute. And we were also uh, fortunate enough to have Bill Kroll and Judd Kenworthy of the Albemarle Pamlico National Estuary Partnership uh, provide presentations on their work. And they have a lot of uh, a lot of interesting projects going on with mapping SAV around uh, the North Carolina coast. Next slide, please. So for the Fish Habitats of Concern document, uh, the Habitat Committee drafted this FHOC, de these FHOC designations for all commission-only managed species plus Atlantic sturgeon. Um, and in drafting this document, we considered current commission documents like such as the fisheries management plans, species habitat fact sheets, the habitat management series publications, and of course, current literature. And the designations for these fish habitats of concern are based on Four criteria, uh, the importance of the ecological function provided by the habitat, the extent to which the habitat is sensitive to human-induced environmental degradation, whether and to what extent development activities are or will be stressing that habitat type or the rarity of the habitat type. So for example, here is a spot and the habitat committee recommends for larvae, brackish and saltwater marsh and SAV and mesohaline and polyhaline waters. For juveniles from Delaware to Florida, low salinity bays and tidal marsh creeks with mud and detrital bottoms that contain their epifaunal and infaunal prey, as well as submerged aquatic vegetation in the Chesapeake Bay and North Carolina. For young of the year in the early spring, seagrass habitats are very important, so we've designated those. And for adults, tidal creeks and estuarine bays with mud and detrital substrates, which support mud and prey. 
Um, and, and sort of an additional point is that bottom tending fishing gear may uh, impact spot FHOCs. So that is something to consider. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Simon. Any, any questions for Simon? Lynn? Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation and for your work on this. It's, um, I think it's just becoming increasingly important as we face climate change, climate change effects. But I, I just wanted to ask you a couple questions about the striped bass um, section. And, and that section opens by saying that um, adult striped bass are highly concentrated and most vulnerable to exploitation in their offshore wintering grounds. I'm just a little bit curious about that sentence and wondering, that doesn't include outside three miles, right? Is that? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I, in, in full disclosure, I am, was not here for the development of the document. I was the one who whipped everyone into finishing the document. <laughs> <laughs> that's totally fine. <laughs> but I will, I'll, uh, I'll ask the one who is responsible for that section. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Thanks, Simon, and certainly thanks to all the folks that, that work on Habitat. You know, without the Habitat, the rest of this stuff we talk about is kind of pointless. So uh, it's just good to have the, the effort and energy put into it like we do have. So, Tony, question? I just want to reinforce something that Simon said. Uh, the committee is needing to decide on their, those two things I want to talk about. The committee is, deciding on their next habitat management series document. So if the policy board has um, issues or ideas of where that, what that document topic should be, please um, get in touch with myself or Simon and let us know what those topics are. Or if you just generally have some topics, um, ideas so that Simon can bring them back to the habitat committee, that'd be great. Um, these management series documents are to help out this, the states, and so they can come up with ideas, but they would love to have topics that you all are interested in or will help you um, as you develop policy back at home. Um, so please let us know what those are. And then the second part is we are looking for an action today to approve the Fish Habitats of Concern document. Um, if people are comfortable doing so, Lynn, I do not have the answer to your question, though. Um, I'd have, we have to check with Wilson. He wrote that section, so. so we have a motion. All right, we have a motion uh, regarding what Tony just described. All right, so we have a draft motion to approve the Fish Habitat of Concerns document. Is someone willing to make that motion? John Clark, do we have a second? Malcolm Rhodes is a second. Any discussion on that motion? Any opposition to that motion? Seeing none, motion carries. And Lynn, we'll get a response to you. And if there is a major change, we can make a small tweak and let the board know what that small tweak what would be. Thank you. And I, yeah, so I, I have a couple, a couple of, I know the ship is sailed. I have no problem, but maybe if I can just, maybe I'll give you a call for just talk over a couple things. That'd be good. Yeah, I'd be happy to discuss that further. All right. Very good. Thank you, Simon. All right. We do not have any non-compliance findings. Thank the good Lord uh, to deal with. Uh, we do have some other business to deal with. Uh, We've got Eric Reed online. Eric brought this up uh, earlier in the meeting, so I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Um, uh, he's got a, a subject he wants to discuss with us and a, a request for a possible action of the policy board. So, Eric, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. You can proceed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, or Mr. Ex Officio Chair, whichever you prefer. Uh, I did bring this up yesterday under. Uh, the business session, uh, but uh, the executive committee, I'm sorry, but it's it's mainly to bring attention to, to the board members who are not on the New England or Mid-Atlantic councils who've already addressed the issues surrounding the 12th survey performance by the Bigelow. Um, 
you know, if and when the federal trawl survey fail, fails or falls short, which it's been doing quite a bit in the last several years, the impact on the fishing community is really not ideal. Uh, survey alternatives to the current uh, trawl survey are con conducted by the Bigel are being considered now. NTAP, the North Northeast Trawl Advisory Panel, of which the Commission is a member, is working on it now. And one alternative under development is using industry vessels to complement not replace, but complement the current survey. Uh, New England and the Mid-Atlantic both passed similar motions at their last meeting, and I'm really looking for a unified position of support from all three management bodies on the East Coast. And I'm happy to read this motion into the record whenever you're ready. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Eric. I move that the Commission supports the New England and Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council's request for information on an industry-based survey, and the Commission send a similar letter requesting that the Northeast Fisheries Science Center completes a white paper by January 12, 2024, outlining an industry-based survey that is complementary to the spring and autumn bottom trawl survey for the Commission and the Councils. And if I get a second, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and I don't really think I need to provide any additional rationale unless it's necessary, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Do I have a second to Eric's motion? We've got a second from Ray Kane. All right, so we have a second to the motion. Uh, he's provided some rationale. Any questions for Eric? Any, any discussion on the motion? Any opposition to the motion? Everybody feel comfortable? doing this, a lot of heads nodding. So sounds like the policy board is fully supportive of this, Eric. So uh, staff will, will work to, to uh, get this done and, and make sure we uh, weigh in as we need to on this. So thank you for, for bringing it to the attention of the policy board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's a beautiful day here in Southern Rhode Island. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Eric. All right, Dan, you've got an item, I think, for us. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm wondering, and it dawned on me toward the end of the horseshoe crab meeting, I'm wondering if we could um, communicate to the horseshoe crab uh, board or the, or the, the, uh, the, the state directors uh, or the leads to um, endeavor to quantify effort in pot fisheries that use horseshoe crabs. And I'll just give you a little bit of uh, background. My agency has applied for an incidental take permit uh, with the National Marine Fisheries Service for the takes of uh, leatherback turtles and occasional right whales. And as part of the exercise, we were uh, required to describe our pot fisheries, which was uh, is one of the gears that um, entangles leatherback turtles. And it was quite revealing for us to be able to document about a 55% decline in the trap hauls uh, which means there's probably a 55% decline in the need for horseshoe crabs within the Massachusetts sector of, of pot fishermen. And so it dawned on me that it's probably some, the kind of statistic that we should be gathering. Um, it's, uh, and, and this was the whelk fishery, of course, we don't have an interstate whelk plan, but I think within each of the agencies that is represented on the horseshoe crab board, at least most of them, they have access to that data. So I was wondering if we could communicate um, informally to uh, maybe through um, Caitlin, um, asking states in the in the maybe at their next meeting, the next time we do convene that group, or maybe just through correspondence, the potential for enumerating um, trap haul or effort, especially in light of today's conversation uh, with the folks from Delaware that talk about reduced effort. It'd be nice to put some numbers to that and not just have anecdotes. All right, thank you, Dan. Tony, you got a... Uh, I think Caitlin will reach out to the states and we'll do the best that we can to get responses. All right, thank you, Dan. All right, and I think you have something you want to make the board aware of. This is just a quick FYI since it's coming up quickly and I think we just learned about it yesterday. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Council is going to hold a public webinar scoping session on November 1st to solicit stakeholder input on um, some summer flounder regulations, including minimum mesh size and um, mesh exemptions. 
uh, we will email out the information on the webinar itself. It's from two to five on the first, but it, we think it would be good for the states to send this information to their summer flounder permit holders so that they can provide input. I think the council is soliciting this information because they may take up this issue. Um, I don't, I assume that our board would also take up an issue with them since uh, we have both state water and federal water commercial fishermen um, using mesh for, so um, I just wanna make sure that the state state permit holders get input into this process. Thank you, any questions about that? All right, seeing so you none. Know, any other business to come before the policy board? Seeing none, uh, then before our journal, we'll call on Bob. Yeah, just real quick, kind of where we are within the meeting now. All right, thanks. And we'll, we will stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>